So uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Pat Kenny. I'm the superintendent of Shenandoah National Park, and I'm joined with by. Good evening, Jim Shabrell, the division chief for natural and cultural resources at the park. So thank you for joining us tonight. We're here to talk about the uh, changes that we're proposing for the backcountry camping permit program in Shenandoah National Park. Um, the idea of this program is to improve uh, the information that we gather about the use of the backcountry. And as we've also laid out is there would be an additional of a recreational fee added to the program that would help support the program. So for tonight's uh, program, we will go run through a, a short presentation. There will be an opportunity to present questions to us at the end. Uh, you can utilize the chat feature to do that. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, you may need to move your mouse around a bit to get the control panel, and there'll be a chat button that will appear. Some, oftentimes, it's at the bottom of the screen. Um, all of the slides that you're seeing tonight are, are, are numbered. So if you want us to go back to a particular slide in your question, uh, we can reference that slide and bring that back up so that, that we'll let you, uh, so we can show that information. Um, we will accept public comment for 30 days. Uh, which the deadline will begin, I mean, the, the comment period will open tomorrow and run through July 6th. We will use an online uh, commenting system preferred, but you'll also be able to send a letter to the superintendent's office. Uh, we'll provide that information at the end of the presentation. We do ask that you take a moment to mute and uh, your, your audio feed and as well as turn off your video. This will help with bandwidth and avoid disruptions of the meeting. So as I mentioned, there are a few goals that we're looking to achieve uh, with the changes to the backcountry camping permit. Um, we are looking to create a more modern system. Uh, we are still a paper-based system. Uh, we're looking for it to be easier uh, process for both the visitor as well as the staff that are trying to manage the backcountry. We believe the system will increase visitor safety through having better information available to us uh, to know where people are, and it'll allow us to have a better opportunity to protect the park's resources. Again, this will get, we'll be able to gain timely, accurate information for the management of the backcountry. And we just, so um, the next thing, uh, sorry about the technical glitch there. Um, so the current system, uh, is, is based on the 1998 Backcountry Management Plan. Uh, this allows dispersed camping throughout the park. Um, we do have some sites, uh, designated sites near the AT shelters, as well as the shelters themselves. But we've documented over 500 sites that are regularly used for dispersed camping throughout the park. Um, Shenandoah National Park is a very much of a backcountry park. We have over 65,000 annual overnights in the backcountry. This is one of the top 10 in the National Park Service. Uh, the table on this slide shows the top 10 for the Park Service. So you see where Shenandoah falls at, at the, in the sixth spot based on 2022 data. Um, this program helps preserve park resources as well as provide value visitor experiences. Um, the current system, how we currently manage things, is a permit is needed for all backcountry camping. The permits are free. Um, the permits obtained in person, either at a self or at one of the visitor centers or entrance stations, uh, there is self-registration. And we do have a, uh, the ability to do them online currently. Uh, camping, a camping permit allows for 10 people to be in the party as for a total of 14 days in the backcountry. Uh, the permit does not do anything. There still is a requirement to pay the entrance fee to come into the park. So back in 2021, we, we, we came on and talked to the public about several fee related and permitting changes in the park. Uh, we introduced the concept of changing the backcountry uh, camping permit fee. Uh, we talked about utilizing an online permitting program called recreation.gov 
This is a nationally uh, available uh, reservation system that the National Park Service as well, other, as well as other land management agencies use to managing uh, these types of activities. Um, we talked about eliminating the, the paper-based system, the hang tags that many of you might be familiar with. Um, it's a very antiquated system uh, to do this. It's very intensive, uh, pay, uh, staff intensive to manage those. Uh, we, we talked about requiring a fee. We talked about the fees being in the $20 to $30 range. And we committed to coming back to you with more details. And the park has definitely given that some more thought. We did take comment on this. Some of the highlights of the comments that we received in 2021 was this would be challenging for long distance hikers, through hikers on the AT, uh, that we shouldn't be implementing this during the hiking season, that it should be more in an off season if we're gonna implement something like this. And there were concerns expressed about having a fee added at Shenandoah National Park. I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to carry on with some of the presentation to give you a little sense of where we're going in the future. Thank you, Pat. So our existing challenges that we have in the park, uh, as Pat alluded to, the uh, permit system is paper. So it's labor intensive and, and fairly slow for getting accurate data and information about visitors and camping. Uh, we can't respond very well to uh, the visiting public with regard to emergencies. So if we have a wildfire, an overdue hiker, those kind of things, it's hard to find people in the backcountry with this system. Um, it's costly to deal with the paper. So the paper has to be retrieved. Uh, we have to uh, do data entry from what's on the tag and then create a, a database system and maintain that database system over time. So it does um, cause a bottleneck for um, education, trying to connect with permittees and get a better feel for what the park is about, backcountry rules, those kind of things. We don't have that uh, connection with the visitor very well, uh, especially through self-registration processes. So the impacts, and you can see a couple of pictures on this slide, um, some of the, the troublesome impacts that we have. Illegal fires is a very common practice. You can see the firing in that bottom picture. Uh, we uh, remove fire rings in the backcountry uh, the upwards of 150 to 200 fire rings each year are removed in the backcountry. So routinely we have backcountry fires and occasionally some of those get out of hand and we have wildfires as a result. So that's a challenge. Uh, trash, like you can see in the upper photo, um, just people leaving and, and not practicing leave no trace uh, ethics, uh, kind of making a mess of things, uh, chopping vegetation trees, damaging vegetation trees leaving food for wildlife, all those kind of things. Sorry. So what are we talking about as far as uh, this system um, tonight? So there's, you can see in that top box, the two, uh, that white bar, the first topic is uh, reservation fee and then recreation fee. So that's the way the uh, fee is split out uh, for the user. But the combination of course is $15, six and nine. So you can see that bottom bar uh, across uh, the page uh, talks about for one person, it's uh, $1. For two people, it's $24 and on up, as you can see the costs for a larger group size. For comparison, um, if we look at that $2 at Shenandoah, what we're proposing is $24 for two people uh, for a permit up to 14 nights. Um, prices in other parks, Great Smoky Mountains, uh, that same kind of ticket or that same kind of permit would be $32. Uh, if you're a long distance hiker in the Smokies, it's uh, $40 for an AT through hiker. At Olympic, it's $38 for that same price point of two people, two nights. And at Mount Rainier, $26. So you can compare that with what we're proposing tonight. I apologize. I keep going in the wrong direction. So to allow this, we're, we're asking people to use recreation.gov. Uh, there's two ways to do that, by going online, or uh, a person can use, um, uh, call into recreation.gov, their, their help system, and phone in uh, a permit as well. So there's two options. Um, 
We're planning uh, enhanced web planning to, or trip planning tools on recreation.gov and on the park's webpage. You can see off to the right about backcountry trip planning. We're uh, with this system and what we're proposing tonight, there's no changes to the existing backcountry camping rules, regulations, none of that. This is all about the, the permitting system and not uh, it doesn't affect camping. So where would this money go? What would it fund? Um, increased uh, backcountry patrols is very important. We've gotten lots of feedback uh, about how uh, people in the field can help and uh, provide education to visitors, uh, trip planning in the field real time uh, to help park resources as well. Uh, there's areas that need rehabilitation and uh, we're, we're intending to pay for that through this funding. Um, also, education is leave no trace. So you, you saw that picture earlier about the garbage in the backcountry. Trying to um, talk about leave no trace and the ethics behind that. Uh, trip planning tools, I mentioned that earlier, both on recreation.gov and on the park website. Um, also addressing the campsites that are out of bounds, what we call out of bounds. So roughly 60% of the, the sites that we've inventoried in the park have some type of issue. It's too close to a trail, too close to water, too close to a building, those kind of things, or they're, they're, um, they have a big footprint. And then the last piece would be to help maintain the sites and the facilities in the backcountry. Uh, trail maintenance, whatever it may be, has a cost. So the rules, um, you can see with this new permit system, of course, the, there's a continuation on the need for a park pass or entrance fee. That doesn't change. It will be required. Uh, the next question would be, can I make a reservation? Uh, when can I do that? So you can do it the day of, say I'm going camping tonight, or 90 days in advance. That system will allow that um, to do it when, when you make your reservation. Uh, are permits refundable? Uh, so the, the two pieces of that, um, that fee that we talked about, the $9 per person portion can be refunded if you cancel in advance up to uh, at least 72 hours notice. And then the modification of the permit. You can modify that permit um, at, on recreation.gov um, and you can change everything but the start date prior to printing and saving. So you'll have to get some experience doing that. Um, and you can modify, uh, you cannot modify the permit once it's uh, printed and saved. So we're just going to go through a couple pictures, screen captures of what recreation.gov would look like. Um, here's an example where you'd get on the, the park page, you'd get onto recreation.gov, find Shenandoah, and find backcountry permits. And you'd get a screen like this. Uh, you can see the uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, lots of uh, helpful links about backcountry camping, um, suggested trip itineraries, those kind of things. So again, having information available for the, the camper is important. So this is the next screen. Uh, this is the example at the top of the screen in the gray box, that uh, gray section. You can, you can see Appalachian Trail uh, starting ending at the boundary. So if you're a through hiker or a long distance hiker using the AT and passing through on, in the park, um, this would be the first uh, step on the process. And you would identify the number of days that you would uh, need that um, permit. And um, it's pretty simple for the through hiker. Uh, the next page is just to start entering your details of your trip, your name, your address, those kind of things. And if you have uh, recreation.gov saved on your computer or um, an app, you can um, have all this automatically, automatically populated for any time you go into recreation.gov that information would save. So another itinerary would be uh, one of the three districts in the park. This example shows the North District and the different areas, the different zones, as we call them, within the park that you would choose from. And so you would choose North District and then, for example, pick one of those. And in this case, it would be the AT Thorny, Thorny, Thornton River, Piney, Little Devils. It's kind of a loop system. And that um, the number of trails, the different types of trails that are in that section, in that zone, and some important information you would need to know. The map on the left, the pink map with the zone sections will also be available 
uh, for the user to figure out where they're at within the park. And there'll be additional maps where you can search for your uh, trip planning on recreation.gov. So where do we go from here? So we're going to use the input um, in the next 30 days um, to inform what we do as far as next steps on backcountry camping. So we want your feedback. The timing, um, we won't make this effective until early 2024. So regardless of the decision and how we go about this, early 2024 would be when this would go live. So the public comment um, is open now or open tomorrow through July 6th. And you can see the link in blue where you can find that. Um, it's also on some press releases if you've seen those. Uh, or you can mail these uh, if you're if you're interested in in writing a letter to the park superintendent. You can uh, mail it at that address below. So it's time for question and answers. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> you can uh, see the uh, um, the link there and the uh, address as well. So. Uh, as we get through these questions. So the first question is, what about for community organizations where we might not know a final number of attendees until very late? Um, I think it might be best to wait for uh, creating a reservation because you can do it the day of, uh, and there are no limits to uh, the number of permits that are out there. So my suggestion would be to wait until you know that for sure, even if it's a day of, you can make that reservation. Next question is, will there be an annual season pass mechanism for frequent backcountry backpackers? Uh, that mechanism isn't available to us in recreation.gov. Uh, so each, um, e each permit would be a separate transaction, uh, a separate fee. Next question, will a carrying capacity be introduced on each trail, limiting the amount of backcountry camping users for each trail? That's not what's being proposed tonight. What we're talking about is just trying to uh, automate and make a modern system uh, for campers. Where there's no limits uh, within the park, annual limits park-wide or by zone or anything of, the, of that nature that we're proposing tonight. What we're talking about is just automating the system. These these fees would help pay for dispersed site maintenance, et cetera. How is that, how is that funded now? Um, we use a very variety of sources of funding uh, for management of the backcountry, but truthfully, the backcountry has suffered uh, for the lack of funding in recent times. Um, so this mechanism will create a fund source that will be help us support the backcountry management. Any pricing for students or or military? No, uh, under this system, there would not be any discounts that you might see at, at like in the entrance station fees. This was strictly a user fee for camping and the fee structure that was outlined early in the presentation would apply to everybody. So the next question is, uh, I expect a big part of the park's backcountry problems misuse, fires, et cetera, is with people who have ignored backcountry rules, including permitting. Your plan doesn't address this. Uh, so I, I'm assuming that the, the comment is about our backcountry management plan. Our backcountry management plan talked a lot about connecting with visitors and having support and funding to have staff in the field, staff at visitor centers, staff at a lot of locations for trip planning to get those rules to the visiting public. Uh, we're not able to do that um, lately, so uh, we're not able to support that kind of education, and that's what we're hoping to do now through these mechanisms. As Jim alluded to in recreation.gov, we will be able to provide educational opportunities, such as short videos and things like that, to educate visitors prior to getting their permit. Could you enable using recreation.gov without any fees? Uh, 
we could uh, limit, we, we cannot, uh, the, the reservation fee is required to use recreation.gov. Recreation.gov is a private entity that is contracted by the land management agencies. So we could not collect, we would have to collect at least the, the recreation or the reservation fee, the $6. However, that does not generate a, any sort of revenue that would help support the backcountry which I as, um, would believe it believe is is really important that we have some revenue coming off this program to support the efforts. It's sort of like camping in the park. If you use our campgrounds, you pay a fee to use our campgrounds. So camping in the backcountry would also require a fee. Next question is: Will a printed permit be required to be carried, displayed? or just having an electronic permit on a phone be acceptable. Either of those mechanisms are acceptable. So we will we'll be asking visitors to one way or another, or maybe both ways uh, to be safe. Save it on your phone, save it on whatever your person, you know, whatever you're carrying, have a paper copy if you want to, to print out, just as long as you have mechanism to show that you have a permit. Are, oops. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty. Are there any projections on how much revenue this would raise per year? Um, so when we look at it, we're issuing between nine and 10,000 permits annually. Uh, the average group size has is slightly over two people per party. Um, so our math roughly is about $200,000 in revenue would be generated um, at this point. Again, that's a back of the envelope type projection because some of our data, we do have some data gaps in our current system because of the paper-based system. An alternative would be to raise the park entrance fee by a certain amount of, to raise the same amount of extra revenue. How much would it have to be raised to do that? So entrance fees have a whole different separate set of processes to go through. Um, those are controlled at the national office of, of, of what level of tier park you are. We are currently a tier two park, so we charge $30 uh, per carlo. There are, there's a schedule for that, but in general, there are larger, some of the larger, more iconic parks uh, do have a $35. So that's the maximum right now that's allowed by uh, under that process. Shenandoah has been identified as a tier two park for entrance fees. Will fees apply to persons doing volunteer work in the park? How to designate these? Uh, volunteers would not have to have a backcountry permit. Um, if they're working under in a volunteer capacity for the park under the supervision of park staff doing park work, they would not need a backcountry permit. Next question is the uh, PATC, the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, does the trails maintenance for the park? Why is there a fee needed in addition? So we, we're we very grateful for PATC and what they do in the park. They they contribute uh, tens of thousands of hours of uh, volunteer time uh, maintaining trails and backcountry structures in the park. But it is a, a joint effort. So there's a lot of trails work that's done by um, park staff as well as uh, other organizations that we support. So it's definitely a partnership, but it's not solely PATC who manages trails in the park. I think one other part of that is we, we currently could use support in patrolling the backcountry to ensure that illegal activities aren't happening. So this will create a fund source that will help support some of those patrols that are definitely needed. Will all other methods be removed for attaining a permit once this is implemented? Uh, yes, we will We will move to a completely online or phone-based system using rec.gov for our backcountry permits. No longer would you be able to use the self-registration stations. Um, Recreation.gov is very user-friendly. They have an app for phones. Um, they're, uh, it's fairly simple to use. Uh, as Jim alluded to, you can create a profile in rec.gov and once you build that profile, it's quite simple to, to book a campsite or a backcountry permit. 
Um, the idea of this is to make it more efficient, get real-time information about who's in the backcountry, and recreation.gov is the tool uh, that we're directed to utilize to do that. Uh, next question is, will there be any type of physical tag to carry similar to this, the current system? So again, all we need is some type of uh, evidence, some kind of proof that you have that permit. So it could be just a, a saved picture on your phone. It could be the paper copy that you carry with you, uh, whatever whatever type of evidence that says you have a permit from rec.gov. But the existing hang tags would go away. Right. The backcountry hang tag permits were notoriously inaccurate. People wouldn't fill out group number, number of nights, start date, et cetera. Will the rec.gov system require every box to have something inputted? Uh, for the most part, that's yes. There are required fields within rec.gov that you, you can't complete your permit without filling in those boxes. So it will be a much more, again, modern um, system, updated system to give us more accurate data about what's going on in the backcountry. Is this primarily about funding or protecting the backcountry? Why does an SMP slash Department of Interior find more money elsewhere? Can you can you find people who misuse rather than change charge all the good users? I want to go back to you know Shenandoah is in the top ten of fee based or of backcountry permit parks. It's number six in that in the list, but we're the only one in those top ten that don't charge a fee for that. So is there a, a benefit for having a fee tied to this? Yes. But the purpose of this is to improve our information. First and foremost is improve visitor safety and the information we, we gather to uh, improve the operations and the management of the backcountry. You know, fees are a necessary thing these days in land management. And I would just say that in that of those top 10 parks that were listed in that earlier slide, all of them are charging fees for backcountry use other than Shenandoah National Park. So it looks like that's the end of our questions. Um, as far as uh, what you can do next steps, again, we encourage you to give us some input. Uh, you can go to that um, uh, uh, URL that's on that on this page and uh, you'll, you can find that on the, um, uh, what do you call it, press release as well. And then um, a lot of information we're going to post on that Pepsi site, on that um, URL site, in addition to the park's uh, website. So we're going to have uh, information about frequently asked questions. Uh, we're going to have information like this presentation, which will be uh, available for your viewing and uh, additional information that uh, could be helpful in your uh, understanding of what we're, what we're proposing today. So that'll be available tomorrow, midday or so, by the time we get it posted, uploaded, and, and working. Um, and again, you have until uh, July 6th for that um, comment period. So we want to thank everybody for participating tonight. We really appreciate it. We know that there's a lot of people that really care a lot about Shenandoah National Park. Again, our goal here is to improve the park and make sure the park is here for future generations. I think... Um, you know, changes to any sort of system like this are difficult, and you know, there'll be some transition periods if we move forward with this. But I think it's important to recognize um, this is a very typical system for use for backcountry management throughout the Park Service, Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management. Um, again, our goal is to protect park resources, provide better information to visitors, improve the visitor experience and overall ensure that the backcountry here is for is available to future generations that's in good shape. So thank you again for coming tonight. We really appreciate your interest in Shenandoah National Park. Good night.